Hello and good morning to those of you here in the U.S. Good afternoon to our UAE colleagues and let me wish a time appropriate greeting to people everywhere else in the world. Thank you all for joining us today for our Raising Climate Ambition on the Road to COP26 Perspectives from the United Arab Emirates event. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. And I'm also the director of the Global Energy Forum, which will be returning in person to Abu Dhabi this January. We're really looking forward to being back in Abu Dhabi. Today, our distinguished guests will discuss the UAE's efforts to pioneer investments in low carbon solutions at home and abroad. As a longtime global energy leader, the UAE will play a key part in the energy transition and the development of long term clean energy solutions. This month, the UAE became the first Middle Eastern state to make a net zero emissions pledge by 2050 and is expected to invest 160 billion in clean energy solutions as the government raises its climate ambitions. In concert with the US and 30 additional partner countries, the UAE is also launching the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate. And as it prepares to take a seat on the UN Security Council this coming January, the UAE is also poised to champion climate as a priority on the international security agenda. So a lot to talk about today to discuss these topics and give a preview of what to expect at COP26, which starts next week. We are honored to have with us today Her Excellency Mariam Almheri, the Minister for Climate Change and Environment of the United Arab Emirates, and Her Excellency Lama Nuseba, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the United Arab Emirates to the United Nations. Now, before we jump in uh, to our conversation with our distinguished speakers, I have a few reminders for our audience. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag AC Energy and hashtag COP26. We are on the record, currently live streaming on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We encourage you to share and post about what you hear today. Now, second, if you are watching on Zoom, you can ask our distinguished panelists questions through the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. Without further ado, I'd like to now turn to our distinguished speakers. Your Excellencies, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's wonderful to see you, and we're looking forward to seeing you in person in Glasgow next week. Now, my first question is for Minister Amheri. So the UAE's goal of net zero by 2050 is the first in the Middle East and North Africa, and as well as the first in OPEC, and has raised quite a few eyebrows. Your government has described the goal as a new economic development model. What does that mean in practice and what prompted this announcement? And then how are you gonna proceed with implementation, which is really the tough part of this? Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And, and again, thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting us. And it's lovely to be here with my colleague, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Lana on this panel. Um, before I answer your question, Randy, I, I think it's really important for the listeners to know that um, we're, this actually came as a very natural step for us. Why? Because we've already been working on so many steps in the past years. First of all, if we think back 15 years ago, um, our, our leadership already recognized that an energy transition is coming up and that it's important for us, you know, we, we like to be global problem solvers and uh, to be basically on the peak of the wave and not under the wave, it was really important that we say, you know, we need to diversify our economy. And one of the things was to actually invest in renewable energy. And so with that, if we look at um, uh, what we've done so far, we've invested about 40 billion US dollars so far in clean energy projects just in the UAE in the past years. So we are operating three of the largest in, in capacity, uh, lowest cost solar parks. Uh, we are the first country in the region to actually um, operate as a zero carbon nuclear energy uh, plant. And once that's fully operational, it will cut down a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions in the power generation sector. We have the region's first commercial um, scale carbon capture uh, utilization and storage network. Currently, the capacity is 800,000 tons a year with expansions already underway. 
as many of you know, uh, Mazdar City is also here in the UAE, was established in 2006, basically acting as a catalyst for the energy, renewable energy transition. Uh, the international community who have supported us in hosting IRENA here in the UAE, um, it basically shows that this is also um, a, a symbol and, and a token of, of uh, our pioneering efforts in the transition um, uh, when it comes to, to the energy transition. Um, not forgetting that we're actually the first country in the region that also signed and ratified the Paris Agreement. We've submitted already uh, two NDCs. And so with that in mind, it is actually a natural step for us to say, okay, now we're ready to actually pledge for the target of net zero uh, by 2050. Um, and in doing so, we actually took a really a, a holistic approach. So we had key uh, ministries, we had the private sector, so key private se sector stakeholders, not only the large uh, um, private sector entities, but also uh, small and medium sized businesses. The youth also played a role. And we basically looked at all sectors, um, energy, economy, industry, um, and uh, infrastructure, transport, waste, agriculture, environment, and made or uh, basically developed a framework of how we could reach uh, to, to this uh, target. So, so for us, this framework is in place. And now we will go into the details of de detailing out the plans that we need to be able to reach uh, this, this goal. So what I basically want to say with this is it's a history of our leadership and that we see ourselves as, as global responsible citizens. Yeah, that, that, that's, it's fantastic. And the ambition is, is really remarkable. Um, you know, one of the, the main reasons there's so much excitement about the UAE's net zero announcement is that the country is one of the world's most important hydrocarbon producers. Um, but, but because of this, um, many people also see an implicit tension between oil and net zero. How, how do you see the UAE's oil industry figuring into the net zero by 2050 goal? I think what's really important, Randy, is that people should realize this is a transition. A transition meaning um, we can't just switch off the tap. There is still a global demand for oil and gas. And so as we ramp up clean and renewable energy, we'll also be ramping down oil and gas production. But at the moment, there is still a global need, so we'll, we will still be supplying. The important thing is that um, if we do, or whoever is supplying hydrocarbons, it's important that it's as, as low carbon as possible. And uh, this is where the UAE really has a competitive advantage and that we are probably amongst the top hydrocarbon providers with the lowest uh, um, carbon, um, uh, carbon intense um, that, that is available in the world today. Um, not also forgetting that um, also uh, our large uh, national oil and gas companies such as ADNOC, they've also put targets forward committing to uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030. So um, each sector is, is committing, each sector is, is going on this new trajectory. I like to call it new trajectory because in a way, uh, this, this, this initiative is actually taking us on a new economic tra trajectory. We see it as an opportunity uh, for new skills, for new investments, uh, for new industries, and really attracting people to come and live in the UAE and, and, and go with us on this sustainable journey. Thank you. And it, I think that's it's so important, as you say, that it's a transition. And what we're seeing right now with the energy crunch globally um, is, is that we're not paying attention enough to the transition and that the UAE is a responsible provider of energy where people need it. It's such, a, such an important role to be playing. Um, I think the other key point is that even in a net zero scenario, such as IEAs, there's 24, 25 million barrels of oil demand per day out in 2050. So there's still going to need to be oil in the mix. And you're, so the, the low carbon production is, is really, really key. Um, so thank you. It's, it's really wonderful. I want to turn now to Ambassador Nusaiba. Um, 
I'd love to talk about the, the foreign policy side of the climate equation. So again, we're talking about UAE's hydrocarbon production. Um, been quite a unique, UAE has been quite a unique international player on climate change. You're the host of, of IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency with 184 members. Uh, the UAE held the preparatory meetings for Ban Ki-moon's and uh, Antonio Gutierrez climate summits. You also, UAE is also a major underwriter for renewable energy projects, as the minister described. Um, and then in January, the UAE is joining the UN Security Council and has become a prominent voice on the issue of climate security. So what is the UAE's vision and strategy as it joins the Security, security Council, and how does climate play a role in that? Rani, thank you so much for hosting us. And it's great to be uh, with my close colleague, Mariam Mahari on this panel, uh, who's recently taken on, in addition to the important food security portfolio, the really important climate change and environment portfolio. And it again shows how we think in the UAE interlinking uh, issues that have been uh, leading up to the subsequent COPs. And as you also know, uh, we are in the process of hosting and hopefully securing uh, our bid to host COP28 in the UAE. And we'd like to see COP26 very much lead uh, to that process and to that to the outcomes that we all want to see. And I think this is, again, as you said, there are so many um, evolutions in the energy and climate space that this is a very different conversation to one than perhaps we'd have even had a year ago because of these structural changes that are taking place. So Miriam's described some of them, mitigating greenhouse gases, as we've discovered in the UAE, is now cheaper uh, than not mitigating in many situations like with solar. Uh, and then also where I sit in the UN in New York, for many countries, this is now a very emotional issue. Uh, it really is a uh, priority. We're not just reading about uh, climate disasters, but many of the countries that I sit around tables with are experiencing them pers personally in their countries. Um, so uh, small islands, arid countries, different climate disasters that are impacting. And so the, the sort of the voices are getting louder that climate security is something that we need to address as a global peace and security issue. And of course, at the midst of all of this, a horrible pandemic that's really made it clear how interconnected all of these issues are and how much stronger the multilateral system needs to be to, uh, to respond to it. Um, so I think when we talk about this, we talk about the drivers of uh, a progressive climate policy for the UAE. Um, we need to, of course, understand, as you just said, Randy, where different corners of the world are coming from. Development is a, you know, seen as a fundamental right of nation states. They have the right to develop, they have the right to become stronger uh, economies. Um, and yet from the UAE model, and I think this is where we exist in the space of trying to show alternatives by doing, um, we, it looks counterintuitive at the outset that a country like the UAE would champion things like renewable energy, net zero, climate security, but it's actually our way of demonstrating uh, that we need uh, counterintuitive, what seems like a counterintuitive approach at this moment. So at the 30,000 foot level, um, obviously our vision for all of us, particularly post pandemic, is that we need to increase global prosperity, global security through climate action. That is the prism now, one of the key prisms through which we are looking at increasing global prosperity, incre increasing global security. Uh, and so investing in renewables, this climate smart agriculture that we talk about, uh, the areas that Miriam outlined, all of this, in our view, as we enter the Security Council, will generate wealth, jobs, and therefore stability, and therefore is an integral part of the peace and security conversation. And of course, the inaction scenario is the exact opposite. The inaction scenario is displacement, resource competition, social stress, uh, protests, uh, fragile states. And so countries that are slow uh, to embrace a low carbon transition become economic losers, worsening fragility. And that makes the job of the Security Council and the UN harder. So that is the, the sort of pitch we are making along with other countries when we enter the Security Council that climate security is genuinely something that needs to be addressed as an integral part of hardcore discussions as they are described of traditional peace and security issues. Uh, and I think in the UAE, this also stems from our long tradition of horizon scanning, um, which is the mindset behind some of the cabinet appointments you've seen. We have a minister of youth uh, uh, who was appointed at the age of 22 because we actually 
wanted to have the perspectives of youth at the government table, and this was the quickest way to integrate those voices. Um, and so that kind of horizon scan, a minister of AI, because we know that the development of AI is going to define um, the future in terms of development of countries. So I think that our leadership in a similar vein to those uh, cutting edge issues also took this view about 15 years ago that climate change was going to fundamentally alter global dynamics. Um, so the economy, the politics, uh, the security, um, the food is all interlinked. And I think that we've also seen that although we are able to make these incredible gains as a country, um, social gains, education, health, uh, and from selling hydrocarbons, uh, wave not under it. And I think that's the decision that we took 15 years ago to explain why this seemingly counterintuitive policy became such a driving part of our foreign policy and our perspective globally. Um, and so with IRENA, which you've mentioned, and 184 countries in Abu Dhabi looking at this issue, um, we think we, we've really been at the forefront of these changes and in predicting these changes and trying to prepare the resilience of our society and the society of, of countries around us uh, for them. Having said all of that, the pace of climate change uh, I think is far scarier in many ways than people predicted 15 years ago. And that's why I think you're seeing this acceleration now in the international community. And we certainly see it in our humanitarian aid portfolio. So we've seen one climate disaster after the next. We've spent billions of dollars over the last decade on relief uh, for climate disasters or, or on conflicts that are inevitably worsened uh, and unequivocally worsened by the impacts of climate change. And so many of the communities that we're working with are in experiencing climate change as a form of violence. Uh, and that's not to be underestimated. And the testimonials are really haunting on this. So if I talk to a senior diplomat from Kiribati, uh, they told us how a king tide ripped through her house without any warning while she was home alone with her infant grandchild. And she was holding onto the door frame with one arm. If we talk to diplomats from the Lake Chad region, um, you know, there are these emptied villages where the remaining residents worry about how to feed their children as the crops fail yet again. Um, two of our big renewable energy projects in Antigua and Barbuda and the Dominica morphed into reconstructions of their power systems after hurricanes completely wiped them out. Uh, and they wiped out vast swath swaths of the GDP in the job market. So all of our indications in our horizon scanning, unfortunately, without being too much of a doomsayer, is that these trends are going to increase and we're particularly aware of that in the Middle East, where we have the least water and the highest temperatures. So bringing this all back to our foreign policy, I think it's twofold. First, we really need to speed up mitigation, uh, and it's a powerful driver, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, conv convincing countries that climate action is actually good for their economies, I think, is the best case argument that we can make. So it's carrots alongside sticks. Um, and I think every country has these unique circumstances, but we hope that our net zero goals provide the diverse proof point um, for climate action. Uh, and of course, everyone has to work their own way uh, to delivering on the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, and I think you're seeing these, but this is something that I think generates high returns and we need to make the, the case for that. And the investment case for us in, in any case is clear. Um, and second, of course, there has to be more multilateral spending on adaptation. Um, and it needs to be made through, uh, we've already won the debate to a degree that it needs to be made through a gender lens, but now we need to win the debate that it needs to also be made through a security lens, that uh, spending on adaptation is actually a security issue. And we used to think of adaptation as basically in, in the UAE is turning the AC up higher uh, a little bit every summer. Um, but we now see communities falling apart because we are not moving fast enough. And I think there's a straight line for us from these circumstances of distress and instability. So how do we do that international public financing to help these communities, to help women specifically, and to sort of help this spiral into humanitarian situations and conflicts. And that really has to be prioritized, particularly for uh, the multilateral uh, financial institutions like the World Bank, uh, as well as for the UN agencies and programs. And so we're really vocal on these two issues because we see firsthand both the opportunities and the risk um, and we also see that the timeline is getting shorter and shorter. And I think this dual economy, security, gender approach uh, on climate is really a pillar of our foreign policy as well as our multilateral engagement. And you'll hear us talking a lot about it as we join the council on January 1st. Wow, thank you. I mean, that's a really comprehensive answer and um, lays out 
an amb really ambitious agenda, um, tying climate and foreign policy together. Really, really fascinating. I want to dig deeper, though, into climate at the Security Council itself. It's a very visible topic, and a there's a split between some of the most powerful countries in the Council on whether climate change is a real threat or not necessarily a threat to peace and security. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, many countries, especially the small island states, low-lying nations, uh, many developing countries are saying climate change is an existential threat expected to destroy infrastructure, food, displace populations, create uh, an atmosphere of fear and fragility, all of which you just described in detail. Um, so that, um, into the conversation at the Security Council, what do you hope to achieve by that? Well, look, this is a, obviously an ongoing debate that's happening right now. There is a, uh, a draft uh, Security Council resolution that's being discussed by member states, that's being championed by Ireland and Niger, uh, that it would be the first time that the issue of climate security is put in a UN Security Council resolution like that. There have been discussions. I think there's been an evolution of the subject on the Council, uh, but we're not ready uh, quite yet. The time is not as ripe uh, as it could be. And I think countries are working behind the scenes to try and see if this is the moment with all the cops coming up and the urgency of the UN reports that shows that how far off our targets from Paris we are uh, to see if we can generate some action around this. And, you know, I, maybe I will invite some criticism here, but I'm going to say that I think climate security as a concept is maybe less controversial than it appears on the surface. And I do also want to say, although this is a climate security and energy discussion, that the geopolitics and the backdrop always influence uh, all of these thematic issues on the council. And the climate is no less uh, of a, an arena, if you like, uh, for proxy disagreements around bigger geostrategic issues. Uh, so just as a backdrop, I think when people at the UN say um, climate security, there's actually a broad acceptance that they're referring to the ability of climate impacts to destabilize communities and countries. I mean, that's the, the, the baseline of it. And, and therefore a bet conflict um, and reduce the ability of a state to safeguard its territory uh, and that is the fundamental uh, purpose of a state, of a government, uh, the security of its borders, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, this can be manifested in a number of different climate uh, relevant ways, or, you know, rising sea levels, destroying food production or literally changing the land mass of a country. Um, but I think we're at a point today, uh, and I'm going out a little bit on a limb on this one, where very few people doubt that there is impact. There is impact from a drought on a fragile or conflict afflicted region, that there is impact. We don't quite draw a, a linear line, maybe in some countries, that that uh, event, that climate event leads directly to instability and war, but there is impact. And it's about measuring and the scale and the spectrum of that impact, where I think some of the disagreements lie in terms of how the Security Council should address it. Um, and so no one thinks that the UN is about to send in peacekeepers to enforce the Paris Agreement or take over the rainforests. Um, well, at least no one right now at the Security Council thinks that. Um, and, and we'll see how the, the discussion evolves. But at the same time, uh, I think people understand uh, and appreciate the uh, impact that climate has in fragility or in a conflict. So that's the emerging uh, and welcome consensus um, that we see emerging, that climate change undermines security in many specific situations. And this is allowing the slow seeping, if you like, of climate language into Security Council resolutions on places like the Sahel and Somalia without objection from uh, the council members who would traditionally say, well, let's let's hold back and we don't want to start discussing everything. There are other bodies and other agencies to talk about these issues, to address these issues. Those are the forums. This is the forum dealing with peace and security. So we should be very focused on that. I think that's that's now broadening in their perspective. And of course, the sticking point is going to be what the Security Council can actually do um, given its mandate versus the mandates of entities like the UNFCCC, the World Food Program, the, uh, the World Bank. And so I think that, um, so enhanced early warning systems, reinforcing peacekeeping missions when climate disasters strike or are predicted, that all sounds like common sense to most of us. Um, and so we're really proud to be part of the two groups currently brainstorming and advocating for the council's responsiveness based on the data, based on better information, based on better risk analysis. Um, so we're members of the uh, group of friends on climate and security, uh, which the US recently joined alongside 60 other countries. 
Uh, and we're hoping we put ourselves forward to co-chair the council's members subsidiary body on climate security in 2023, which is also the year we hope to co host um, COP28, where we hope to drive the conversation forward, not in a polarizing way, uh, and not in a way that allows for some of these geopolitical tensions that I've mentioned to play out, but in a way that really tries to close the gap on our understanding, basing it on the data. And there are some really low hanging fruit that we can all uh, aim to achieve. So we've recently launched a work stream um, with the UN, with Norway and with IRENA to transition peacekeeping missions to renewable energy. Currently there, I think about 80% relies on diesel energy. You know, low hanging fruit, it's, it's a bit niche, but it's a pretty compelling aspect of climate security. Um, and renewable energy cuts costs, operational costs, it reduces um, the risk of attacks on fuel convoys, uh, which is another inherent security risk in peacekeeping operations. And it basically provides this much needed longer term sustainable infrastructure for the communities that the peacekeepers are there uh, to help. So I think some of these partnerships are going to really come to fruition during our council term. And it's already resulted in the heads of the biggest peacekeeping mission signing a compact to identify three renewable energy projects each in 2022. So getting uh, commitments like that, I think is really, really important. Um, and of course, you know, there's a number of other areas I think we can do more quotas uh, in the same way that we have gender advisors and specific missions, why not climate advisors? Um, humanitarian and development agencies really need to better integrate the climate prism and the climate security prism at that with the same urgency as they look at other security threats when they run a peacekeeping operation. Uh, and of course, for the UAE, the area that specifically concerns us in our, our region is, of course, food security. Um, so I think when we talk about that, we're also talking about the practical steps to address uh, some of these realities and some of these threats. So I think the Security Council can play a part. It can't offer the full so solution, nor would we want it to. There are many other agencies and mechanisms, uh, but we do need to be holistic about our approach. And I think going onto the Council and seriously discussing uh, this climate security resolution and looking at it seriously, the pros and the cons and where member states have concerns and where those concerns can be addressed, I think is a, is a really good first step in the right di direction to broadening the security prism uh, through which we traditionally view peace and security issues on the Security Council. Ambassador, thank you so much. Uh, really, really fascinating. And I, I, the, the, your point about the geopolitical backdrop ha, um, being the sort of context uh, through which all of these conversations are happening is is really important. And I feel like, you know, we could do a whole other session on the geopolitics of the energy transition as we're seeing it play out right now with the energy crunch and um, the what's happening at the COP all at the same time. Really, really interesting. So I, I love to talk with you more about that at a future date. Uh, but but actually, right now, I want to pick up on something you said and go back to Minister Elmheri. Uh, you mentioned food security, um, and Minister Elmheri, your your last role was as the UAE's food and water water security minister, and a portfolio that you brought over uh, as the new climate minister. So you'll be at in Glasgow at COP26 uh, next week, and you'll be launching one of the potentially most significant partnerships uh, that that will come out of the COP which is the Agriculture Innovation Mission, or AIM, for climate. And so this initiative was announced by President Biden and your prime minister back in April, and uh, the US and UAE have, have been co-developing it since then um, to innovate the world's food systems out of the danger climate change places on them. However, the UAE is not known as a major food producer. So why is the UAE moving into ag tech and food systems innovation as a vector for climate action? And then, and then second follow-on question, what can we expect from AIM uh, coming out of this COP and then going into the future? Okay, so um, Randy, the same way as, I mean, it, it really comes down to, and, and Lana already mentioned this as well, um, we're really blessed here in the UAE that, that our leadership really kind of have foresight in, in their DNA. And um, food systems uh, is very interlinked actually with climate. And that's why uh, me becoming now Minister for Climate Change and Environment and actually taking everything I was doing before, so the food and water security files are, are with me as well in this in this ministry. Um, they're, they're very um, interlinked because as uh, many of you know, um, a third of greenhouse gas emissions comes from our broken food systems. So they are a problem, but they are also the solution. And going back to what I was saying in the, in the beginning about the, the foresight of our leadership, already many years back, 
uh, we've taken a lot of steps in how we can also transform our food systems into more sustainable uh, food systems. Um, we import most of our food. So over 90% of our food is imported. So we're very much connected to the global network when it comes to um, the food supply chain. And um, ensuring that we're not just food secure today, but also food secure in the future, we've really gone into looking at what we can do, um, not only to diversify from where we're bringing our foods, reducing food loss and food waste, um, but actually looking into also things like how we can, or what we could grow in the UAE, what makes commercial sense to grow in the UAE using innovation and technology that is now available for us that maybe wasn't available many years ago. So kind of looking at the food systems, not only from a producing point of view, but also from a consumer's point of view. Behavior is also key. Um, what you buy the supermarkets, what you put in the bin, also has a huge effect on our food systems. And um, we just had the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and now we're going towards COP. And um, it's, it's, they are so interlinked that, uh, that now when you say, okay, if we can solve our food systems problem, then we also solve in a way uh, a big segment of, of, our, of our climate mitigation actions, or, or it, it helps in solving that as well. And remembering that a quarter of, of the world population is somehow engaged in agriculture. So what it, it's kind of a vicious cycle because the, the broken systems now are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases and that's affecting climate, which goes back to them. So looking at things like ag tech, uh, um, accelerating research and de development is so important right now for us to transform our food systems to more sustainable ones. And this is why partnerships is key, innovation technology is key, and this is how we came about um, developing Aim for Climate with the United States of America, saying that it is an essential need for us to accelerate and invest more in R&D for climate smart agriculture systems. And this is what this, this, this coalition is, is all about. And so far we've got, I think, 33 countries to, to join in. Um, and really every country is kind of doing their R&D, um, their, their, their own projects and, and initiatives, but being able to collaborate, share information um, is so key now to accelerate the efforts because the SDG goals, it's nine years away that, that we have. So we need to work together. We need to um, uh, speak to each other. We need to share knowledge. Um, and, you know, for us, we see, okay, we're, we're able to, to we, are, we have harsh climates here, as Lana mentioned, where we're a water scarce country, where um, we don't have arable land, but technology and innovation has really helped us now grow things in, in our country, which we never thought we could grow. Before. So, I mean, we're growing a lot of fish now. Um, we've got berries, um, mushrooms, and, and all this is because we can actually now work in closed environment agriculture. And as this ag tech sector scales up, the, uh, the operational costs are also driven down because the private sector will always try to fine tune technology. And so in that way, we're also hoping that the UAE is not just a hub for food trade, which, which we are and which we wanna to continue to be, but we also wanna become this hub for knowledge and innovation and in how to grow foods in hot arid climates like the UAE and, and share this, this knowledge with others who are suffering the same conditions as we are. So Aim for Climate is about collaboration. It's about acceleration in the likes of R&D um, uh, for climate smart systems. Really fascinating. I'm looking forward to, to this launch. Are there any, any particular technologies or projects that you just find really exciting? You know, I always say, what, what have we got here? And I call them the three S's. We've got the sun, we've got the sea, and we've got the sand. What can we grow using those three S's? And um, one of the projects I really, uh, I'm, I see a lot of potential in, it's, it's called the C CEAS project. I'm, I'm not sure the actual, it's, a, it's an abbreviation for a project which actually uses seawater. Uh, there's, so they're growing fish and shrimps 
and, and the seawater in the middle of the desert. It's powered by solar panels. And that water uh, the, or the wastewater then goes into um, salicornia swamps. Salicornia is a salt loving um, uh, plant and the seeds are then used as fuel. Um, and in 2019, Etihad Airways flew um, the Boeing from uh, Abu Dhabi to Amsterdam and actually had a small percentage of this fuel in it. Now, from the mang or the, the salicornia swamps, then the water goes into mangroves and the mangroves actually clean out the water, which then gets pumped back to the fish and shrimp. So basically you've got a desert system that is producing high quality proteins and uh, fuel, and it's all um, yeah powered by the sun and built on, on the sand. So in a way, this, this project actually is the start of the, using the three S's. So things like that, uh, closed system farms, CEAs, closed environment agriculture. So you can have different forms. You've got the vertical farms, you've got the high-tech greenhouses, you've got low-tech greenhouses. Uh, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but being able to control your environment um, is something that's really picking up here as well, not just on, uh, let's say on vegetables, but also on the aquaculture side as well. Um, so these things are really picking up and we're, we're seeing a lot of ag tech companies now set base here because the UAE is really trying to change the blueprint of the country. We've, we've been a country that's been very much about um, um, consuming food, which is imported, but now we're moving towards, again, this is part of our sustainability journey and saying, let's focus a little bit more locally. Let's reduce our carbon footprint and our food systems. Being able to source food locally is not only on the on the carbon side better, but it's also on the health side, it's better because it's, it's, uh, it's fresher, it's more nutritious, um, and it um, yeah, actually tastes better as well. So... <laughs> So, so these are some of the insights as, as we transition also in our food systems and why Aim for C is so important for us and, and why we've decided to, to, to lead this uh, with the U.S. Minister, thank you so much. I've actually visited that the pilot project for the fish salicornia aviation fuel. Um, it's really remarkable. And um, it's very cool that this is actually having an impact both in decarbonizing aviation, which is a challenge, um, and also uh, uh, bringing local food to the UAE. Really, really fantastic project, really innovative. Um, I, wanna, I wanna pivot now to um, uh, Ambassador uh, Nusaiba um, for one more question, um, which is we wanna talk about the need for broader international cooperation. Um, now this has been mentioned many times throughout the conversation, um, but we also recognize, and, and we talked about this a little bit, that there's a growing trust deficit when it comes to multilateral organizations' ability to act in the face of increasing complex, increasingly complex global issues. In, in that regard, how, how do you see the UN uh, increase its effectiveness to ensure that it can tackle 21st century challenges like climate change? So really a simple question, no, no, not a hard one at all. How does the UN become more, uh, more, more effective on climate? Let's add a few more hours to this panel. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. And first of all, uh, sun, sea and sand. Miriam, I'm starting to feel incredibly homesick in rainy New York right now. So thank you for that. And I think we should add tourism to your list of portfolios. You'd be the best brand sell. Um, no, I'd, I'd like to, to sort of strike a note, a little bit of optimism on, on, on the UN system and the multilateral system. And we hear a lot of um, moaning about its effectiveness. And we all know that it's as effective as member states allow it to be, as, as, a, as effective as member states empower it to be. And the UN itself, its secretariat, its, its civil servants can't enforce um, things like delivering on the remaining 20 billion US dollars committed of the 100 billion at Paris. This has to be a gap that people leadership are urged to do by their uh, populations and by their public. So I think that striking a note of optimism, if the UN didn't exist, we would have to invent it. It would be much more difficult today given the geopolitical environment. So thank goodness we have it. Let's all work together to make it stronger because there is no other multilateral system uh, that is an effective umbrella the way the UN is to oversee some of these really essential funds and programs that do have such impact, such high visible impact 
uh, on the lives of people around the world. So I think specifically to climate action, uh, how do we make our systems more effective? There has been a huge shift globally. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen it in um, everything from school children protesting on the streets of their capitals and striking about going to school uh, to how it's, it's, it's ingrained now in most education curriculums around the world. There's been this uh, inexorable march towards a recognition of climate action being necessary for the survival of mankind. And people are looking to the UN and to the COPs and to these meetings and to government to deliver on that sense of urgency. Um, so, and if we look at that change in tangible terms, let's look at early 2020, there was only a handful of major economies with net zero announcements. And now we're at 70% of global GDP being covered by net zero pledges. Uh, and with the UAE, you have the first Arab country, you have the first OPEC country that made that commitment. And we've all seen the recent announcements that show the, the positive reinforcement of that message of everybody getting on the climate action uh, train. And of course, we need more than that. And of course, none of this happened by magic. There have been some very serious meetings, including in the UAE, uh, about how to be able to make good on those pledges. We don't just make these pledges as part of a uh, a PR blitz, we actually have to be able to deliver on them. And we care about being uh, called to account for the pledges that we make. And so we've had a number of internal meetings with all the relevant divisions before making an assessment and then a, a pledge like this. And I think this is happening in other countries. Um, so we do want to make this more of a norm. And if the UN is anything, it is a norm setting institution where countries uh, walk into that building and they negotiate the sort of rules of the road uh, the framework, if you like, for the best possible practice in international cooperation. Uh, so when you walk in there, uh, aspirations uh, I like to become norms and practices in many ways when negotiations go well. Um, and so, for example, what do I mean by that? The Secretary General made Net Zero a centerpiece of his uh, 2019 summit. And so we all heard from the leadership of this organization, uh, sort of like our Pope in many ways, he sets the moral tone. Uh, and and you, you didn't see this flurry of net zero announcements, but his advocacy did help pull the lever uh, around the world with countries saying, this is something now that uh, we need to take seriously. This is aspirational uh, for all countries around the world. Um, same thing with the Security Council. We see how stalemates lead to... Um, to impact on the ground for the people suffering in those conflicts and in those fragile situations. Um, and at the same time, we only hear about the negativity. We only hear about the vetoes. We don't hear about 57 resolutions passed in 2020 by consensus. We don't hear about the system when it works. And maybe that's on the UN to communicate better. Um, but I think yeah, it's no small feat that 100,000 blue helmets are deployed around the world in some of the most fragile settings um, in order to try and mandated by the council to be there in order to provide that sort of barrier between a fragile context and disintegration into a failed state in many of these contexts. So there has been a lot of work that has been done. Um, but of course, we can't just accept um, mixed progress as our aspirational benchmark um, for multilateralism. We need to do better. Uh, I think the UAE is definitely one of the countries uh, that feel the UN system can do better. And we're very much in our conversations trying to hold the UN uh, to higher account. I think many other countries are also um, in that process as well. And I think, of course, there are some key elements that need to be part of that inclusion, the widest possible inclusion uh, of people. Uh, I think people need to feel heard. They need to feel that their decisions are impacting um, peace and security issues on the ground. Um, and I think, for example, the way we uh, deal with the private sector is very last century. I think that could come up to speed in terms of the private sector's approach. And I think our integration with the private sector uh, needs to be more, uh, more business driven in terms, of, in terms of getting them on board. It does a lot of very, very good work and we need to help it become more effective. And I think that the strong multilateral system helps all countries, big and small, uh, live in a more peaceful, uh, less fragile world. So with that optimism in mind, I think we're very clear eyed, but we're also optimistic, which is why we're saying that hosting COP28, serving on the Security Council, neither are walks in the park, but we think we will have impact and be able to amplify that impact by doing those things. So we shoulder that responsibility. Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, a really fantastic way to end this program today. We are unfortunately out of time Thank you, uh, your excellencies, for joining us today. Really thank you to everyone for tuning in for this really remarkable conversation. 
I'd also like to thank everyone who helped put this event together, including Zach Strauss, Reed Blakemore, Lauren Holland, Josh Gross, and Dan McQueen. Uh, for more Global Energy Center events, you can join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern for a conversation on the European energy crisis and the way forward. You can find out more on that about the Atlanta Council website. And then starting next week, the Global Energy Center will be live from COP26 every day at 5 p.m. GMT with updates from the COP, interviews with global leaders, and special events. So more information about this will be coming out soon. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Elmheri. Thank you, Ambassador Nusaiba. Hugely appreciated this conversation. Really look forward to seeing you uh, both again very soon. And again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll, we'll see you more at uh, future events uh, uh, very shortly. Thank you for having us.